Hi, my name is Mel Wilson, and I am the Senior Policy Advisor for NASW, and I want to welcome everyone to this podcast. The podcast is on gun violence in America. A quick statistic on gun violence in 2023, approximately 46,000 people were killed through gun violence, and actually half of those, and over half of those individuals killed were killed uh, by suicide. So this is a major issue, obviously, and a big public health issue. Uh, with that in mind, um, I want to introduce uh, Colleen Crichton. She's a senior director and for the in, uh, Family Fire, and Kelly Sampson, who's a senior counsel and director for Racist Justice with the Brady uh, Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence. Uh, both of them are going to talk about where Brady is with these issues and some of the actions that uh, Brady is involved with. Uh, a little more information, NESW is a partner with Brady and have been so for the last I guess, at least five years. So we're committed to this issue too. Having said that, uh, ladies, it's your game. Hi, everyone. Um, as Mel said, my name is Kelly Sampson and um, I'm an attorney at Brady and I also work on policy issues at the intersection of race and gun violence. And I'm sure that this audience, many of you have probably seen directly the consequences of our gun violence epidemic that we're experiencing in this country. And you probably know all too well um, that a lot of the gun violence that impacts people that you're working with results from a lot of structural factors. And that's something that we've been doing a lot of work to both build a consensus around and then also build policies that treat gun violence as a preventable public health issue that has identifiable causes and identifiable solutions. Because gun violence, especially gun homicide, does disproportionately impact Black and Brown people in the country. And for too long, for many decades, that's been treated as something that has to do with the people suffering rather than the conditions and the structures and the factors that lead to gun violence prevention. But what we know, sorry, at least to gun violence, but what we know is that gun violence is predictable. We can see where it comes from. We know what happens and how guns get into communities. And so a lot of what we're doing is really pushing against the narrative of inevitability and really treating gun violence as a public health solution. So that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Colleen. There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Colleen Creighton. I'm Senior Director of N Family Fire for Brady. Um, I love the NISW. I've spent a lot of time in my previous role uh, with the American Association of Suicidology, we worked a lot on the issue of suicide. Uh, I've now moved over to gun violence, so it's it's exciting that I get to keep working uh, with NASW again. What, what I primarily do uh, here at Brady is talk about the role of safe storage of firearms that, that it plays. We lose, like you said, Mel, earlier, most of the gun violence deaths across the country are suicides, but yet nobody ever talks about those. Um, and this is something that uh, disappears it affects every state, every community, every age, every region around the country, but no one is talking about it. So that's why I'm excited to have the conversation is we there's a quick and easy intersection. It's a quick and easy call to action. You know, we don't demonize gun owners. We don't get political. We don't get partisan on my side. Uh, we just say, if you have a gun, just help reduce the number of lives lost to gun violence by just locking your gun up. So keeping it safe from theft, keeping it safe from kids getting a hold of it or keeping it safe from someone in crisis who accesses it when they shouldn't. I, I guess, and I, I think that we, we can uh, sort of get into some, a little bit of dialogue. And one of my, I should say my, it should, it's the organizations concerned and the nations is around the, the issue of um, urban gun violence, which, which is, has been constant for decades. And, um, Recently, as everybody knows, there's been a increase, though that I think that's dropped off some. Uh, and I guess, Kelly, I guess my question is, what are some of the remedies besides the issue of the underlying issues? But on that day to day basis, uh, it used to be and I'll say used to be because I used to be a direct service worker as far as mental health uh, in, in the community. So I, I pretty much know uh, what's going to put. So it used to be talked about in terms of, of gangs and other things. I think there's a cultural thing going on when I say culture, just the idea of having guns as part of that young culture. So are there, are, is, is Brady 
has a, a specific program or some ideas of where, where we need to go with this? Yeah, um, there's kind of two ways that we think about it, not only at Brady, but in the gun violence prevention movement writ large. So when it comes to gun violence, especially um, as you're talking about sort of this entrenched cycle of gun violence that we see in a lot of cities, there's two aspects to it. We think of sort of the demand side of the firearm. So people, as you said, who have in many cases valid fears about their safety because they see um, that they're at risk. They know people who have been killed by gun violence. And so they feel like they need a gun to be safe. Um, and so that's sort of the demand side. And there's a lot of work there really at the community level with credible messengers and people who know um, often exactly what people are going through because they've been in that lifestyle themselves. Um, and so you see a lot of community violence intervention programs, hospital-based intervention programs. And really what those are doing is bringing a public health approach to effectively the disease of gun violence and really working at people at the level of um, trauma, the level of fear, the labor of level of behavioral change, and really helping people to interrupt cycles of violence. Um, and Brady partners with organizations that do that. We support funding for that. Um, but a lot of the work that we do is really on the other side, um, which is the supply side. So guns don't grow on trees. They don't fall from the sky most of the time sure. with ghost guns. And 3D printed guns, which is a whole other thing, aside, guns start out in a lawful manufacturer's factory, and then they go to a distributor, and they go to a dealer. And all along that chain, those guns are identifiable, and they're supposed to be sold in accordance with federal and state law. But what happens is we know that a lot of times guns are diverted from that legal market to an illegal market, and it doesn't happen by accident. Most of the time it happens through recklessness or negligence, or even in some cases, sort of a willful disregard. And so a lot of the work that we do focuses, number one, on stemming the flow of what's known as crime guns into communities. And the way that we can do that is we know that there are a lot of gun dealers in this country, like a lot more than I ever realized before I started working in this field. Yeah. The vast majority of those gun dealers, however you feel about guns, don't sell a single gun used in crime in a year. So what that means is a small majority of gun dealers that do sell not only one crime gun, but in many cases, many crime guns in a given year should raise some alarm bells with federal and state authorities who are responsible to say there's something going on at this shop that is leading guns to get into the illegal market and it's hurting people. And so our crime guns program really works at that level to identify um, and help identify who exactly the crime gun dealers are and then support or work with, or in some cases, compel state and federal authorities to focus their very limited resources and their limited by intention on investigating and holding those crime gun dealers accountable. So that's one way that we, we do that. And the theory there is that if people know that they're going to be accountable for selling guns that, in a way that is negligent and irresponsible, that they will either reform or they will no longer be in the business. Along those lines, we also um, bring a, a legal approach to that, and it basically models the same theories that you see in the opioid cases or tobacco cases, where um, those industries that act negligently and irresponsibly are held to account, and it sends a signal to the rest of the industry that we're watching you and you need to follow the law. So we do that. And then obviously, there's also... Um, a legal, or sorry, a legislative aspect to this. And what we do there is really work with state, local, and in many cases, federal legislators to create evidence-based laws that will work on the supply side to reduce guns that don't have any other purpose but death and injury. And so we advocate for laws that do everything from working with a type of weapon. So things like assault weapons or accessories to weapons, um, such as auto sears that can turn weapons into fully automatic, um, to working with laws that really regulate who can get a weapon or how people can get a weapon. Because we know that in many cases, simply having things like requirements around licensing can really help to prevent gun crime. So I said a lot, but in short, a lot of the solutions that we're working on on the supply side have to do with the flow of guns into communities, 
and then also the types of guns that are available, and then creating more regulations around how people obtain guns. And they all are supposed to work together. There's not one magic solution that we work on. Um, we really need all these things working together. Did, as you were talking, have a thought on that. And for me, sure to sort of shift it just a little bit to, to that street level and the issues around family and, and environment. Do you guys get into that at all in, in with Brady or do you basically say, say that the broader community and, and government needs to sort of step more firmly in that? But is that some area that you guys cover? Um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, if as to whether Brady sort of works at the level of some of the more like underlying factors, I would say we don't directly work on those sorts of issues. We support organizations that do, and we definitely advocate for funding. Um, that's a lot of what we're doing as well. I think where we address it and what we see our role as is we really want to come alongside organizations that do that community-based work work, and really try as much as we can to amplify and push back against stereotypes um, and really continue to beat the drum around the fact that this is a public health issue that is right. not inevitable, that it is not something that can't change. Um, and so our organization, given that we have a national platform and a pretty high profile and ability to sort of set an agenda. What we really try to do is elevate that as much as we can um, so that the organizations that do that work get the funding that they need and the support that they need because gun violence is kind of, in a lot of ways, a really weird issue because if someone has cancer, yes, there may be a few fringe people that say it's their fault because they ate Cheetos or something like that. But by and large, people give them empathy and concern. And with gun violence, especially as it impacts Black and Brown communities, um, a lot of times people don't give them any sort of empathy because they almost think that it's like their fault. It's true. Um, and so right. when we go into these spaces, a lot of times that's what we're up against um, is people who sort of think like, well, it's inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. It's those people's fault. So we're trying to support organizations that do that work by making sure that the policy solutions and everything that we advocate for really brings a public health lens to what's happening because we know um, that this is not inevitable. It's definitely something that um, yeah. is sort of a result of a lot of different structural factors. And, and maybe there's something NASW is definitely helping with. But it's also personal. I think yeah. the other thing to, to note yeah. is that a large majority of the staff for Brady are, have been impacted by gun violence uh, in some fashion. Some are lost survivors. Uh, um, some have been injured by gun violence. Some have lost family and friends to, to gun violence. And the way we're structured at Brady as well is that we have chapters throughout the country. So it's not just an organization based in DC where you, know, you see our, our logo and our brand, we're actually comprised of those in communities throughout the country as well. So when we bring the issues forward, we're not just talking from straight policy lens. It's more of a this is the Brady family throughout the country, and, and these are our concerns for, for us as well. And, and, and as you spoke, Colleen, uh, I know uh, in your introduction, you talked a lot about that suicide piece and your involvement in the past. And that certainly intersects with a lot of things that, that were NESW is and uh, the behavioral health, mental health pieces. That. Could you just elaborate as, as much as you can? Because it's such a big part of, of gun violence and it doesn't get discussed enough in my life. No. Um, and, and so 80%, I'm just going to read a stat right here. 80% of the firearms suicides by kids 18 and younger involved a gun belonging to a family member. And then the firearms suicide rate among children and teens has increased by 66% over the past decade. So what we're seeing is unprecedented. You're seeing the numbers going up. Nobody's talking about it. And then in, in a lot of different communities, too, it's there's a stigma attached to it, to suicide. And now you're combining, you know, we're afraid to talk about guns. We're afraid to talk about suicide. Now you're asking us to combine these two issues into one. 
it's a lot of folks that they don't know right. how to tackle the issue. Um, so one of the things at Brady is, you know, especially what we're doing right here is having that conversation. Don't be afraid to ask, is there a gun in the home? If someone's in crisis, because a lot of times we think of it just as an injury prevention for someone themselves. Studies show you're more likely to be injured by the gun in your home than you are to be able to stop an intruder from entering your home. Because there's this misperception out there that I need a gun for safety. Someone's going to come barging through my door. And this is the security uh, um, system that I have. When in reality, you're more likely someone's going to wake up in the middle of the night. A child is going to find it. You may have someone in your family that's suffering through crisis. You may have, unfortunately, we, we work with a lot of parents who their kids are going to play at other folks' homes, you know, especially during the summer, a play date, things like that. And they're finding a gun that was stored in, in I saw like a shoebox or in a shelf uh, or in the sofa or in a mm -hmm. car. Um, we're seeing a lot more upticks for kids finding guns in cars. So all we're saying is, you know, one way to prevent, put time and space. If someone's in crisis, that's OK. There's a lot of systems out there. There's a lot of ways to get them help. But putting time and space between someone and a gun is going to save their life. Yeah, there's a statistic out there and, and I can't refer to issues of ethnicity and race, but there's one that's out there on suicide, dealing with older white men being a very unique population that has a very high uh, rate of, of, of suicides. And I may have read it somewhere through Brady or through other, some other source. Could, could you address that as, as a vulnerable population? It, it is. And, and well, there, this is a there's a caveat here, too, because this is something when, when I was with the American Association of Suicidology, we worked a lot on thanks to Jonathan Singer, so, who, uh, Dr. Jonathan Singer, who I know NASW yeah, knows I know, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was. When I led the organization, Jonathan was my my board uh, president, so we worked closely on this issue because while statistically, yes, older white males are the ones that are taking their lives more often. By saying that, by putting that that information out there, what you're neglecting is spikes in various populations throughout the country. Um, I just read an article today in uh, Native Health is what they're scared about is they're seeing significant spikes in Native Americans taking their own life. Um, mm -hmm. We have black youth, we have uh, Hispanic young girls. There's a lot of spikes that just by concentrating on that number that, you know, here's the mass critical mass numbers uh, individuals taking their own life. We're neglecting a lot of other populations out there, so so that's why. So yes, it, it it is a key population, but I want I want us to be a lot more diligent in ensuring that you know we're saving lives in in all areas of the country. Right, and, and just for Kelly and Colleen, given what you said that and it being the public health context, uh, then we're talking about various groups. What are some of the plans in order to, as far as communicating? Because yeah, obviously when you want to get out and do prevention. You have to talk to that group and understand from where they're coming from. Are, are the communication strategies that that uh, Brady may vary in even around policies that they use a, a varying approaches to those communities who are not immediately seen as being vulnerable? So I, I think it's a multi-prong approach, right? So right, ha right now what we're dealing with, so the White House today put out something um, on safe storage. And that's where we're seeing a lot of, you know, suicide prevention is through safe storage of firearms because guns are the leading cause of the weapon or the, the method used. Secondary is faith-based leadership around the country. There's a lot of effort there mm -hmm. through um, SAMHSA and uh, a lot of the efforts there through Brandon Johnson. What they've done is a tremendous job in bringing all different faith leaders together and saying there's a national day of prayer. And on that day, I, I believe it's November, everyone comes together throughout their house of worship um, and they have the discussion about suicide and kind of destigmatizing it. Then, like Kelly mentioned earlier, there's a lot of groups, national levels, associations. So working with your group, NASW, right, to, to get right. throughout the country, um, but also on the community level, there's a lot of groups doing phenomenal work, um, getting into um, youth centers, talking to you know new parents. Doctors are another um, avenue, like ranchers, doctors, all these different groups really working with those in those communities to, to destigmatize it and to have the conversation. Okay. And this is my last question. You guys can, can use some time, maybe talk a little bit more uh, if you want. But it, it, it does, again, go to messaging 
and the question in urban communities uh, that I guess it's a general question of the receptivity to messages. Uh, I, I would imagine that the Centers for Disease Control, if you guys may be working with them or there or maybe a lot of good literature out there, but in urban communities, do you feel that there is a receptivity to prevention messages? And going back to safe storage in the same question, does ideas of safe storage vary by community? So I'll ask Kelly and then Colleen, you can pick up, but just just that focus. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to like gun violence prevention, especially around um, like homicide, there's a lot of support. And obviously, communities aren't a monolith. But when we look at polling, for example, among Americans who express support for gun violence prevention policies, or even the notion that gun violence is a problem, um, you definitely will see higher rates of support around both of those from communities that are most impacted, which makes sense because people are seeing and they're experiencing on a day-to-day basis in many cases, gun violence or fears about gun violence. Um, And a lot of communities especially will say like, we have been saying for decades that this is a problem you know, we've been marching, we've been working with our churches and our faith communities and asking for people to take gun violence prevention seriously. Um, and as more and more people in the United States are impacted, um, it's now become really salient um, for communities that perhaps didn't see themselves impacted. But among like Black and Brown communities, there's a lot of people who will say like, yes, this is a huge issue. It's my main issue. It's something I think about a lot. Um, with the acknowledgement that it's not a monolith, of course, and that there are um, people with diverging views, but I would say, generally speaking, absolutely. And and from from my perspective, what so we do a lot with public education and messaging, uh, thanks to our partnership with the Ad Council, who are kind of the nation's leaders in getting messaging out through. Um, we've all heard us uh, their their campaigns. One of the things that we do, though, is in in any program or campaign that we launch, it goes to at least like 12 months at least of research. So we're, we're getting right now, we've done a lot with just the issue as a whole. And now what we're digging in over the next two years is really pulling out segment populations and saying, how can we better address your needs specifically? And one of the ways we're doing that is with a Hispanic campaign that we're going to run on safe storage because we realized there was nothing out there in Spanish which is an oversight completely across the country. And so we didn't just say, hey, we're going to translate everything. What we did is we did um, quantitative, qualitative focus groups. We spent months just really researching Hispanic gun ownership. What message resonates? What do you need? Where are there gaps? Where can we help fill? Um, And taking all that information, we'll launch a, a campaign later this year, specifically targeting that. Alongside that, we realized if you look at gun ownership and gun purchasing over the past year or past three years, we're seeing rises in specific. We're seeing Asian American. We're seeing either, um, we're also seeing black mm-hmm. gun owners at a higher rate as well. We obviously our messaging is not going to resonate. It's not just a universal. Here's a message for everybody. So we're spending a, a couple of years really digging into again, you know, what is what does the landscape look like? What are the needs? What needs aren't being met? Where are there gaps? What can we fill? And utilizing all that to roll out campaigns over the next few years as well. Mm-hmm. So, like, so the question is, it's not one message fits all. Obviously, we can't do that. Um, and so that's the, the great part about kind of the, the the width and breadth and everything that Brady has under its umbrella that we're able to do this. Yeah. Before we end this, this, this really great uh, discussion, uh, I want an opportunity for both of you to maybe just close out with some your own messages and, and some of the things you may want groups like NASW or other groups uh, to work with you around your, the partnerships or however you want to take it. So I'll, I'll start with Colleen and then, then Kelly, you can, you can chime in. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be obvious and blatant with this one, but we have an End Family Fire uh, campaign, so it's pretty easy. We don't charge. There's no cost to any of this. We have all the assets. We have all the metrics to show that this is impactful and it, it the message resonates. So visit endfamilyfire.org. Look at our campaigns. We'd love to get them out to more communities. We can help you with like how to get it placed, how to get the radio PSA placed. Um, and other than that, it's not political. So don't let kind of any, it, sometimes it's, it, they're afraid to talk about guns. They're thinking, I don't want to step into an argument with somebody. 
that's furthest from the case. This is something we need everybody to talk about, feel comfortable talking about and bringing forward in their community. Yeah, um, I was just going to kind of piggyback on what Colleen said in terms of the politics of this. Yes, I work on legislation, um, but I do think something that unfortunately has been true increasingly in recent years is that more and more Americans are finding themselves directly impacted. And there's a lot of rhetoric um, that you may see in the media around this being a blue issue or it's not a red issue or whatever the case may be. But when you actually talk to people, um, because gun violence has unfortunately become so pervasive, a lot of those tropes don't apply. Um, and a lot of people really care. And that crosses whether people own guns or don't own, own guns, whether they live in the country or the city, if they're old or young. Um, people may have different approaches. Right. But people do right. genuinely care and they want their families to be safe. And so there are opportunities to have conversations um, that cross, like Colleen was saying, a lot of the EFF work that that is directly working with gun owners. Mm -hmm. um, and so this right. idea that it's kind of a binary, I think, when you actually talk to real people, it doesn't really apply um, for the majority of people. People really do care and they want their family to be safe. Um, and so there's opportunities there to kind of build a coalition around a lot of common sense ideas that people can all agree on. Okay, great. Well, I, my one comment as, as we close is just, I guess a concern I've always had is we deal with mass killings and, and they're tragic and we can't diminish the tragedy, of them, especially the cool school-based killings. But sadly, it, it overshadows what we, we spent this time talking about that that the numbers, it's a, it's a relatively small uh, part of, of the deaths and, 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 and many, many injuries. People don't talk about what guns do to the body in terms of injuries. You may not die, but man, it really destroys lives. And that so somehow collectively, we need to be able to balance that communication and let folks know that the tragedy of mass killings is something that, that everyone needs they care about, but it should not overshadow the, the, the gravity of the whole picture uh, of gun violence. Seems like maybe there's some reduction if you look at the data uh, of the number uh, or the rate of gun deaths, uh, but you know, you, you have to hold your breath on that, see whether that trend holds. But the, I'm just going to take a really collective effort. NESW certainly is here to continue the partnership with, with you all and We'll get the word out to our chapters, but it is a community collective effort and there has to be that buy-in to understand uh, how, how serious this is. So Colleen, Kelly, thanks a lot for joining us and that's pretty much it. Thank you again. You have been listening to NASW Social Work Talks, a production of the National Association of Social Workers. We encourage you to visit NASW's website for more information about our efforts to enhance the professional growth and development of our members, to create and maintain professional standards, and to advance sound social policies. You can learn more at www.socialworkers.org. And don't forget to subscribe to NASW Social Work Talks wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next episode.